Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Travis Gibb, creator and writer of Coins of Judas, Voodoo Nations, Granite State Punk, Cthulhu Invades, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today with a very talented and creative person. I've seen his work <laughs> on Coins of Judas, as well as Grant State Punk, and I got to read both comics, and there are so incredible and so amazing so we have so much to dive into but we're joined by the ever talented travis gibb how are you doing today i am well i'm well i've got some sick kids so our whole house is a little sick but it's part of parenting you know for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person tell us who you are and what you're bringing to two geeks talk so my name is travis gibb i've been uh, working in comics since 2003 but in the last five years i've really taken to the next level i've raised almost two hundred thousand dollars on kickstarter doing lots and lots of books and then this year has been really exciting for 2023 we've jumped into the direct market with both coins of judas and granite state punk so we have of, uh, two different publishers producing those books. I'm most known for a book called Broke Down in Four Dead Bodies, or if you like my anthologies, Cthulhu Invades. The genre of Coins of Judas is what? So for Coins of Judas, I can, I consider it superhero. Um, it is kind of a more of a ghost rider, like Midnight Suns, like Constantine, action adventure superhero book with a brother and sister who have a little bit of like supernatural twist to them. I put it in the superhero genre. It's the closest thing I have to superhero. The genre of Granite State Punk? That is 100% punk. It's own genre altogether. It's punk rock. It is also supernatural. I think they're both supernatural, but that one's more in the veins of like hardcore Vertigo, Constantine, mm. and then according to Judas is more DC Comics, Constantine, right? They're, they're very different. We want all ages to read this stuff. Another is screw that. We just want everyone to read it. Right, right. <laughs> what is the most misunderstood aspect about the supernatural genre then that people may not understand about? It? I think that when you talk about supernatural comics, they tend to, to have low shelf space, meaning they don't last forever, right? Ghost Rider's been rebooted a whole bunch of times. Constantine's, Antana, Dr. Fate, you know, Dr. Strange, they always get rebooted. I think the problem is I, I think people think it's stale. I think that that's not true at all. I think that there's a lot of things in that realm that work really well and, and people love it. I mean, think about the biggest show on TVs are always things that have a supernatural element. Like right now, Last of Us is really popular. It's got the zombie walking dead before that. Or I mean, how many seasons was Supernatural? 78? I don't know. Like it's some sort of ridiculous number. <laughs> um, and I always I tend to draw on that. Specifically for Coins of Judas, I am a pastor. I don't practice on the regular. I don't have a church or anything like that, but I consider myself a marketplace minister, which I know this may really shock you, Kurt, because you read Granite State Punk and someone who claims to be a pastor should not have written Granite State Punk. Like I said, I'm not great at it. <laughs> Taking like some of the biblical elements and kind of mixing it in and adding demons, it's a lot of fun. It's very enjoyable. Well, I mean, some people pray to the masses, other people pray on comic books. And, you know, I'm glad that you're blending the, the two genres. Because if you didn't tell me you were a pastor, I would not have thought of that whatsoever, like in my top five about you, like in, in a. Right. <laughs> Like, what was the time when you were creating both of these books that you overcame a creative issue that you just couldn't quite see through? This is going to sound like a cop-out, but these two particular books, I didn't have either of them. Coins of Judas was, the origin story of Coins of Judas is it was sent in as a book for Mad Cave Studios. They have a book called Wolvenheart. They have like a talent contest and I submitted it and I didn't get accepted. And then I rewrote it because I really liked the story and sent it into Band of Bards. They also didn't accept it for their anthology, but they sent me an email saying, we want the whole series. Can we get this as a series? And that's how that came about. So I kind of rewrote it. And then for Granite State Punk, my grandmother passed away and she left me a decent sum of money and it was the first time that I could 
pick the artist that I wanted, right? When you're early on in indie comics, you can buy who you can afford, right? Like, it's just reality. So I'm not saying they're good or bad. It's the best I can afford. Where in this situation, I didn't have those restraints. Uh, so I picked exactly who I felt would be the best pick for that project. I didn't have to spare any expense and I think it paid off. And when I was writing it, I was actually writing a very different story, but I set it in my hometown and with my grandmother dying and, you know, me being from New Hampshire, it became this whole thing. It kind of spewed itself out to being something different. You know, you can feel that I voice my frustrations with the world in that book and my frustration, but also this counter to it of it, of how much I love the state of New Hampshire at the same time, right? Like I hate it, but I love it. I've been very clear in, you know, past interviews and stuff, people know me. I come from a drug and alcohol family. My parents were drug addicts and I, I had come from a very broken home. And I'm trying to reconcile that in the last little bit of my life. You know, I have a four-year-old son. I was going to be done with New Hampshire uh, because they all died before my son was born. You know, now that I have a kid, I have to bring them to where I, I grew up. I have to show them. So I have to find this new love for it. And Granite State Punk was the first of building that new relationship with the state and uh, of my home birth. A lot of people think that when you create a comic, it's not creative, like especially those that aren't in the weeds in the industry type field. They'll, they'll look at it as a, as a picture book, et cetera. With all the struggles that you've gone through, not only in, in your life, but also creatively, getting these two stories out was more of a, a therapeutic endeavor than anything. 100%. Yeah. Grand State Punk is a very therapeutic. It is the closest to like the voices in my head. If you read Grand State Punk, like you think it's very heavy punk rock. It's actually not. We don't actually talk that much about music until the end, but it's the state of mind of somebody who's in the punk rock scene, right? They all want to solve the world's problems and they all have the answer of how to solve all the world's problems, but they don't want to do a damn thing about it. <laughs> I, I love it. I love talking to punk rock people because they're so profound and so educated, but they don't want to fix shit. <laughs> and and Grand to Judas, it was so good to be wanted, right? Because I've worked so hard on doing all these Kickstarters. I just put together my last Kickstarter. I've run 27 Kickstarters. Wow. I've written probably about 40 comic books. Not all like full issues, anthologies and stuff like that. I've probably been in about 40, 40 books total. Bands of Bards really wanted me part of their book and they wanted me and they trusted me to do it and to put up a two issue thing and we did it, you know, we solicited it, we did it, we put it all together. I sold variant covers, did the whole thing. Like a proof that, hey, you are a valuable to it. And then I out sold everybody at Barnes & Barnes on their highest selling book going like not only is that you have a fan base and you're bringing that to this brand new company which is such a blessing yeah I've had uh, Tim and Chris on the show in the past couple of times and yeah they they really focused on on the creators that they're bringing in and and they do they do everything they can to to showcase them as well too so I think that's incredible yeah. that you're part of the that particular stable speaking of Band of Bards, and we'll talk about Scout Comics as well, too. Sure. And, and of course, we'll ask, we'll talk about your artists as well, because you have to give props to them as well, obviously. Yeah. Band of Bards, how did they support you, not only in selecting your books, but how did they support you as a publisher? Band of Bards and I have a unique relationship. <laughs> they hit the scene very, very strong. And I consider myself like the police of the scene sometimes. And I literally messaged them after they were like collecting names and like doing this stuff. I was like, who are you? Like, what are you doing? What's your goal? What's your intent of it? I met them like probably a year prior to them even publishing their first book and kind of just like pick their brains was like, Hey man, if you guys are going to be on here, like let's figure out your vibe. And we talked and we, we, we seem to work well together. I didn't think much of the company, not as a negative thing. Like my sites were at bigger things at like, you know, Scout, Source Point and Mad Cave and so Band of Arts, but I, I just like them. So so when they did an anthology, I was like, you know what? Why don't I throw my name into this anthology to help them get to the next level? They bring in some of my fan base and, you know, that could help them out. And, you know, they saw that as an opportunity of, hey, can we work with Travis? What what can we do? And that's why we came to a two-issue series in trying to figure that out. And they were so supportive of doing it and trusting me, which is really, really good. Trusting that I could get it done because all we did, we had a pitch. You know, I said, hey, I could do this story at the minimum two issues. Can you afford two issues? I said, yes. And putting it and then allowing me to kind of figure it out. I was like, hey, I'd like to sell variant coverage. Uh, this is their Bard Shop exclusive. 
um, can we do variant covers and what does that look like? And they were like, we've never done it. We don't know how to do that. So I took the reins. We sat together and we came up with a budget that would work for them. And with it, with nine variant covers from various stores around the world for Coins of Judas number one, two more for issue two, which is really good. And let me tell you why that's so good, Kurt. When we go to Diamond, there's about a buck that comes back from Diamond, or actually closer to 90 cents that's split between Band of Bards and my creative team. 90 cents. That's not a lot of money per issue. When we do a variant cover, it's three bucks. Now we're talking, right? So that helps us and it helps them grow and get some money and capital to help invest in other people. It also helps me feel that this is worth it so I can pay my team to do the next one. And it really helps our partnership really well. They've been such a blessing to let me work with them and teach them what I'm good at, as well as allowing them do what they're good at. And how about Scout Comics? How did that come about? And they've been really cropping up recently a lot, which is incredible to see. I love that. Yeah, so this is a wild story. Scout Comics, until this year, had a little side project called Black Caravan. So Black Caravan's the one who produces Electric Black, Phantom Starkiller, Swamp Dogs, and a whole bunch of other comics. So it's a, it was a separate imprint within Scout. It was run by Joseph Svelke and Rich Woodall, both great, amazing creators. They really liked Granite State Punk. I had submitted it to them even before I launched the Kickstarter. I had submitted, hey, I want to do this book. Here's the first five pages. Are you interested? They're like, we're extremely interested. We need to read the whole thing. But that art and what you're trying to tell is really, really good. And they're New England based. Like those two guys are New England based. So they accepted it and got it brought into Scout. Since then, they separated with Scout and I had already signed the contract with Scout and I had the option to leave, but I was like, you know what? Let's go with Scout Comics. Let's let's try it out. And it's been very beneficial to be able to do it. Granite State Punk was a Kickstarter comic first and now it's going into direct market coming out March 29th. You have a campaign currently? I said it was a Kickstarter campaign. I do have a campaign during as well, but it's not for Granite State Punk. Oh, okay. Kurt, I'm like the Hulk. My secret weapon is I always have a campaign. <laughs> and then you don't have any baggage that Sean Penn had. <laughs> You know, you mentioned about your art team and your team in general as well. Who is the team that worked with you? So I have a different artist team for both. The back end team. So my letterer and my editor are the same. So my editor is my wife and a fellow Canadian, Jerome Gagnon, is the letter for all my books. I can't do anything without him. He produces, puts it all together. He is the best. And it's probably because he's Canadian, I assume, Kurt. We have Megacon at the end of the month. He's actually flying down to Megacon. We're going to meet in person for the first time. I'm super excited about it. Uh, we'll go over Grand to say punk first because he's coming as well patrick brumeyer he's oh. coming he's from ohio he's coming down he does the art and he does the full color for granite state punk so he does the full thing I and mean, he does a lot of the covers he's a great creator wonderful guy and one of the few people because i've been doing this a long time as we discussed where i'll go i don't think this is right patrick and i'll give this long paragraph hey this is why it's not right we need to change this panel and he'll jump on the phone with me and by the end of the conversation i realize his genius every time i'm always wrong I have not been right once. We've done two issues of Grand State Punk. Both times I've said something that I felt very strongly about. And he's like, here is why this is the best way to do it. And I'm like, damn it. Why do you got to be right? For Coins of Judas, we have Tyler Carpenter. So Tyler Carpenter has worked with me a little bit over the years. In fact, he is not someone I would have picked for any project. And I, I don't say that as a negative. I love him. I love his art style, but it's manga. Kurt, I have a secret. I don't like manga. Don't like it. I never understood it. I don't get it. I've tried. My daughter, who's 21 years old, loves manga. You know, I have every Western comic to the right of me behind these bookshelves is stacks and stacks of books that I've been collecting since I was 12 years old that my daughter could read. I literally can read anything Marvel. I have every major Marvel storyline in there, but no, she has to read manga. Tyler is a good guy. So I like him. I like working with him. He did a small piece in Cthulhu Invades Oz. He did a small backup piece for Broke Down. He always wants to work on small projects with me. So I submitted him to the anthology that Band of Arts is doing, the Tales from the Static. You know, they liked it. So we just signed him on. So we did kind of a manga-ish book. Coins of Jonas has a manga feel to it. It's been a, such a learning curve because like the red and whites in it. Gotta be honest, guys, not my biggest fan, but everyone in my team they love it. Tyler's like, oh, that's the way we should go. Roland, the guy who colors it. No, this is the way it needs to be. Jerome, my wife, they all love it. It's such a more collaborative effort to go, hey, I'm just going to write a story. I'm going to write it the best I can and trying to go to the strengths of the creator. So go to the strengths of the manga vibe, but write it in the Western style. So it's been so awesome to kind of put all that together. And Tyler, I mean, he just wrapped up a Kickstarter yesterday yeah. for Girl with the Mega Fist. $14,000. When it comes to comics, we're definitely in similar circumstances. 
circles as well too and and tyler was on the show last year oh, okay just his ability to grade and to talk and to be engaging about his passion of comics like like what you are here you there's a very similar vibe i'm getting from both of you so that works out very well for an interviewer like myself because you love what you do yeah, absolutely. I think Tyler and I are the type of people we would be making if nobody's reading it. Luckily, we're both do very well, so people read our stuff. But we just love the medium, and we want to learn. We educate ourselves. We change things, and we're willing to do. You know, I'm willing to listen to Tyler, even though I think I know better. And Patrick, both of them, I'm willing to listen to them because I trust them as creative partners. Where I can't say that about all my projects. A lot of them, I'm very hands on. This is the way it needs to be. This is stuff. These two guys have such a passion, and they know what they're doing. They are going to get me the best results in this work. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, I, Kurt, I have always learned that. <laughs> so as a child, I realized that I was a marketer and I could talk to people and I could convince people. I am horrible at grammar. Probably something you don't want to hear from a writer, but I am horrible at grammar. I, luckily, I have editors. So when I was growing up, I would just write more than anybody else. I always had something to say, so I would write more. So if someone said, hey, do a two-paragraph essay about the subject, I would bring in four pages. And then I would convince my teacher that I did more work than somebody. Sure, my grammar is not great, but I did more work than the other guy. Why are you punning? And I would get better grade. When I used to get in trouble in school, because of my background, I'm rough around the edges because of that. And my values came from comic books, Kurt. So I learned my right and wrongs not from my parents, but from the Marvel superheroes that I was reading them. So I would be like going into homeroom, hey, what? Billy broke up with Sally, F Billy, and I would fight Billy in the afternoon. Now, Billy and Sally could have broke up for any amount of reasons that I'm not aware of, but that girl cried. So therefore he's the bad guy. I would get in these fights that I really had nothing to do with. But I learned, uh, because I did do actually bad things too, that if you always told the truth when you went to the office, like, so every time I would get in trouble, I would tell the truth, exactly what happened, everything. But if I'd ever do something really bad, I would flip the script and, and just lie <laughs> tremendously. And I would get away with it because I told the truth every other time. <laughs> So when I did something big, I was like, so this is what I learned. Always tell the small things, get yourself the slap on the wrist, the answer goes measure. But when you do that really bad thing, you lie because all that goodwill you can use. Probably not the best advice. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't give that advice to my kids, but that's where I learned the power of a voice and like conversation. Those, those two skill sets have got me on my primary job is a salesman. I, I sell every day. I sell web design. I own a web design company and I sell websites and I'm telling people stories, you know, just like I am in comics. I, I, t I take whatever product they're selling and I tell a story. Right now I'm doing a comic book website. I'm doing a lawyer website and a dentist website. Very, very different stuff, but I'm just telling their story and putting it on the web. No different than me putting together a story for a comic. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your varying careers? So one of the pieces of advice, probably the second best piece of advice I've ever got was I was broke one, like literally over on my account. A friend of mine who was a pastor, he said, you know what? Let's make some calls. We could fix this and get you in the positive right now. But does that solve the problem a month from now? or two months from now, or three months from now. And that really stuck with me. And it really changed my whole mind of thinking. Because of the way I grew up, I've always lived in survival mode, right? Just survive to the next day, survive to the next thing. And when I learned that lesson, I was like, you know what? I need to plan for the a month out or two months out so this doesn't happen. What kind of steps can I take now to prevent that? Because I think so many people are always in crisis. You know, you see these people who are in crisis mode all the time. It's because they're just trying to solve the current problem and they're not thinking about the big step of the problem. And I've been able to take that and be better at, hey, how do I market my comic? How do I do this? So I'm always thinking several steps ahead. Where do I want to go? And where do I need to go today? There are two different answers where someone's just trying to get the next thing out, trying to do the next thing where I'm thinking so much far ahead. I think I've benefited from it tremendously. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? You know, because I'm a Christian, because of Adam. I mean, I think it was biblically, you know, we Adam was created. He was like, hey, I'm going to create you. And he's like, go name shit. Like, literally, like, from creation, that is the case. It's all been told in parables and stories. Like, it's just been there. And everybody, you know, every ruler, every stuff, it's because they could tell a story and convince people to follow them. It's always been that way. It's all storytelling. 
it's all creation. It's all doing amazing things. And some of it's fascinating when we create, like running water. Like who looked at the spring is like, dude, I could make our poop go through pipes. Like it's amazing, right? We as people are so innovative, right? We're like that animal, like should we eat it? Like, or before we eat it, should we milk it? Like, should we milk it? For, like, like making all these crazy, hey, let's eat all these mushrooms. Oh, Billy died. Let's not eat that one again. Like, hey, this grapes have been sitting around for a bit. What do you, what do you think we should do with it? Eh, just drink it. It's fine. Like, it's clearly bad. Like, there's mold on. No, I think we should just, dude, this stuff is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the way we've come up with things is amazing. That's why there has to be some sort of divine intervention because I don't believe humans are that stupid. I think somebody had to be like, dude, just wait. It's going to be awesome. Give those grapes a month and you're going to you're gonna knock your sauce off. It's the best selling point for wine, right? The longer you don't drink it, the better it's going to taste. What? <laughs> like it's the best marketing ploy ever. Here, if you want to drink one, drink this one that I've had waiting longer. Like switch it out. Keep that one. <laughs> like... We have, we have always been creative, like from, from conception. I just think now we don't value it as much as we used to because before the, the creative and innovators were life or death. <laughs> what challenges do comic creators face in today's society that maybe people in the industry don't understand? Uh, so there's three things. So one, everyone's goal is different. Some people's goal is to just get their book out there and they don't care how many people read it. And then some people like me, like I want to go the sky's the limit. I want to work for Marvel and DC. I think that that's the first thing. So when you're picking up a book, it's not apples to apples. It's, it's all these different things when you're creating a book. Number two, because my goal is Marvel and DC, I am literally busting my ass so I can be fired in three years because the average writer who works for Marvel or DC has a three-year lifespan. Well, who does that would fight for a three-year lifespan in what people consider a dying industry? It's wild. You have to love it to be able to do it. And then the third one, I don't think they understand the cost. I don't think anybody who's outside of the industry realizes that it costs about $4,000 to create a single book, and that's on the cheap. They don't think of that because they think art is, think of the, how much I paid. I paid $25 for this print. That's my, how much you want to pay for the original. It's not the way it works because of uh, these creation and drug and letters and colors and inkers and all this stuff that you have to put into that. I don't think they understand the cost of it. And then how everyone takes their cut, right? The printer has a, a five dollar book now. The printer it's going to cost us two dollars, two to two fifty to print, right? And then the publisher is going to want half of that, and Diamond's going to want a percentage of that. And then if other people sell your book, they want a percentage because everybody wants a cut of the pie. So it becomes very, very little profit to make that money back. You have to sell thousands and thousands of books to do that. And the average book sells in the hundreds if you're talking about Kickstarter and not going to the direct market. I think that those are the three things. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? Jim Steinman. So Jim Steinman is the writer of Meatloaf's music. You know, everyone loves music, uh, but when I listen to Meatloaf and those nine minute ballads and stuff, I was always fascinated that I'm getting a story. So I'm get, the reason why they're so long is because he's telling a story in those parts. And the fact that you could do that in music, it was so inspiring to me. And then he really spoke to my heart. You know, when I was a teenager, because he was it's all the songs about love or like rebelling against the system or not knowing your place and trying to figure out your way. Um, so he really inspired me to be a creative. And as I studied him and learned more about his history and what he was trying to do and how he's creating music, uh, it was it was such a wonderful uh, man to learn all these these wonderful talents. His desire to just tell this one tale. So he wanted to tell a futuristic version of Peter Pan. So every song you've ever heard that he's done, and not just Meatloaf, Celine Dion, Bonnie Tyler, they, they all have Jim Steinman music and stuff. It's all for one big masterpiece that he wanted to put out in the world. And as someone who loves art and is all that's that's all i ever wanted to do is just create one thing that people would like and he's the guy who inspired me and he's he's that guy from a professional standpoint you have been in the comic industry for many decades you've had many many successful kickstarter campaigns you are picked up by of course band of bards and scout comics so professionally you're successful in that regard do you consider yourself personally successful yes yeah yeah that took a long time to accept but yeah i, I do i do i think it's I'm not where I wanted to be. 
Um, I'm a little behind on my path, but I, I I learned very quickly that the more you look at other people who are doing the same road as you, the, the more you're just going to be upset because uh, there's a lot of luck that comes into comics. Meaning, you know, you create a story, you created it months ago, and then it happens to fit around something's going on in the real world. You know, that's going to obviously elevate your story more than if it came out when it does, doesn't. And, and looking at all those things, I really got it. But yeah, I do feel I'm successful. I am, I'm so proud of where I'm at as a pro and being able to do that and people paying for me to make comics and uh, hiring me to do writing gigs. I, I think I'm uh, very lucky and I'm, I am where I need to be and I'm at the right level of where I need to be in my career. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I just don't fail, Kurt. That's the, the secret. You just don't. Uh, no, I, I take failure bad. Like anything that I let someone down, I, I take it bad. But how I deal with it is I overcompensate. Like if I'm going to be 100% honest, the reason why you see so many books out by me because I'm making double anything else. So if I have a failure, it's a mix, a whole bunch of stuff. It's hard to see it. Like, because I have so many other things, just trying to get that next level and doing that stuff. But I do believe failure leads to growth. I believe every time you fail, you can take pieces of that to get to your next level to help you grow as a person and help you grow in your the young generation is looking at your work and then becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you looking at your work, not only with your children, maybe you're inspiring them to be creative in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Ooh, I think it's really hard. I think we're living in a world that's very different from the one I worked out in my life. I went to you know high school, then I went to college. And I you realize when you go from high school to college that all your friends don't have your back, right? They kind of abandon you as you you move on, you kind of outgrow things. I think the younger generation doesn't have that because of social media. You know, your grammar school friends can be your friends all through your life. And I think that gives a false narrative to the the next generation because they believe everybody has their back. And when you find that you don't, to offset that, I think the next generation is gonna have to be more challenging, say things. I think that, you know, we look at the show The Office. Lots of young kids are liking it because it says things that can't be said on TV and they're not being canceled. Why is that? I think they're going to have to take those risks to say something and risk that you may get canceled. You may be the guy who, who doesn't make it, but your voice matters and trying to find that voice. And if you get lucky and that voice is not something that needs to be canceled for whatever reason, and it has something beautiful and something to say that, that needs to be heard, people are going to rush to that and, and take that to the next level. That's my advice to the next generation is you say your truth speak your truths because as long as you're speaking truth it's going to turn out okay in lie when something really bad happens if you take anything from this interview yes <laughs> <laughs> if your life was a comic book or a movie or a series what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be if my life was uh was a comic book it would probably be called a series of bad choices <laughs> of bad, uh, bad decisions and not like I have never been a drug addict or anything like that, but I'm always willing to go down and make a bad choice and then stick to it until I realize that like you need to change. I have very ser serious segments of my life, but the soundtrack would probably be a uh, second fun album with we are young, carry on. Uh, there's a lot of uphill battles. There's a lot of like depression emo songs in that, but there's a lot of hope because one of the things that makes me unique as a person is I love people and things. So I hold on to people people and I love people and I lift people up every day of my life. Even when I'm making bad choices, I am lifting people up and I'm teaching people those choices. So I think that those would be my, my two things, you know, I'm very much like Peter Parker, right? I am doing this thing that I think is amazing and helping everybody. And I fail to realize what's important. So then I'll switch the thing and go, this is the thing that's important. Aunt May, Mary Jane. Oh crap. Dr. Octopus is running rampant. And I, that balance is never right for me. I can never find that balance. So I really relate to Spider man in that aspect and that's how my life goes too whatever my focus is the other one needs to to be it i i can't find my life in balance it's a it's a teeter-totter well i hate to say this travis but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking i want to thank you oh. so much for coming on the show well thanks for having me it was uh such a great time I've, I've watched a few episodes of your show i think you do a great job thank you i think you're very impactful to the community i think you do some great work and i think that people appreciate you and your impact in the community i don't think podcasters get enough credit for what they do well i appreciate it so you're you're definitely welcome back on the show anytime so you know oh thanks not not just because you said that <laughs> before i let you go where can we find you how can we support you of course where can we find coins of judas and of course granite state punk 
So Orange Cone Productions, where you can find me, that's where you can buy all of our comic books. Uh, but if you want to specifically help Band of Bards or help Scout, you can buy Granite State Punk at scout.com or you can buy at bandofbards.com. You can buy Coins of Judas 1 and 2. Coins of Judas just finished up, so you may be able to even find it at your comic store if you ask them. Granite State Punk, if you haven't ordered it, you can order it at your local comic store. It comes out at the end of the month, March 29th. Go ahead and ask them. They should be able to get it from Diamond. It is past final cutoff orders. Diamond orders a few extra, so you can be able to pick it up. That's how you can find it. I do have Twitters, Instagram, and all that, but the best place, if you want to interact with me on the regular, go to travisgib.substack.com. I have a Substack where I post weekly about what's going on, what comics, and then we we invite you to Discord and we talk and we just hang out. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others literally on my website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Our YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com for slash c forward slash tgt media and the podcast is back after 12 or so years which is on two geeks talking dot podbean dot com and you can find it on any audio streaming service just search for two geeks talking and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking